Good morning, a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us this morning. Um, we are very excited um, to welcome Michelle Dobson back um, to help us understand more about interview skills. So um, this morning we will start with uh, just a short introduction to Michelle. She will then do a presentation. As she's doing a presentation, please feel free to post any questions that you've got in the Q&A. In addition, Michelle will also be asking you to post some comments that we will read out throughout the presentation. So with me, I've got my colleagues, Mrs. Mandu Makanya, as well as Mr. Begim Zorbe. They will be helping me with um, the questions as well as um, the uh, ending of the session. So a very warm welcome to Michelle Dobson. Um, she is a successful um, uh, marketing strategy and branding professional. She has over 20 years of experience in these fields. She is currently the head of brands for Stepstone South Africa, which is operating as PNET and Career Junction. Michelle, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me again. Thank you. So you're welcome to start your presentation. We are looking very much forward to learning more about interview skills. Great. Thank you so much. OK, let me know if you can't see that. Otherwise, I'll assume it's all going well. Um, we can see your presentation. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, great to be back um, with the team again and uh, welcome to everybody that's online. So um, as Lisa already announced um, a little bit about me, I've got uh, a wealth of experience in brand marketing and brand strategy specifically, and I've worked, had the good fortune of working for some really um, wonderful local and global brands. I also ran a digital marketing agency for a couple of years um, and went into some freelancing before, and this is quite key to note, that second last bullet point, before I was actually found on a Stepstone step online recruitment platform. Um, I was passively sitting on the PNET platform at the time, not really actively looking for a job, uh, but because my CV was online and my profile was updated, I was contacted by Stepstone um, for the head of brands position, and uh, it turned out to be a really good match, which is what our platforms are good at. Um, and I joined the Stepstone team in September 2021. We are going to talk about interview skills today um, and the relevance to even though my uh, expertise is in brand marketing, I have been in the world of work for 24 years and have recruited and managed people my entire career. So a lot of what we're going to chat about today, um, you will hear, will be interspersed with, you know, some of the theory, but also interspersed with my own experience in terms of uh, being, in, uh, you know, going for interviews personally, um, as well as interviewing people for specific roles uh, in my team. And then I would really like to know who you are. So if you could please introduce yourself um, in the Q&A, just give me, give me your name. Um, tell me if there's anything specific that you're looking for out of the workshop, any specific interview tips or tricks that you're looking for, anything you find um, you know, unsettling or uncomfortable that we can guide. Um, and then we'll come back and visit some of those um, responses in a moment. And I'll see if I can sort of guide the conversation um, along those lines as we go through the content. So just a little bit about um, Stepstone. As Lisa mentioned in the introduction, Stepstone is a German-based company um, and it owns the two local brands, PNET and Career Junction, in the online recruiting space. So essentially what, what PNET and Career Junction do is we help companies find the right talent. So we are the platform provider, the enabler in the, the big gray circle in the middle, um, and we basically uh, match companies to the right talent. In other words, to to job seekers that are are looking for looking to move or looking for their first jobs. A brief history. So both Career Junction and PNET have been around for almost twenty six years. Um, they were created in completely independently um, as job boards uh, during sort of the internet boom um, as a way to host 
jobs and vacancies that companies had. So it was really about, you know, instead of going and and, um, and uh, pinning a job to a, you know, a, a board somewhere or at a recruitment um, company, uh, recruiters and, and companies could come and put their job listings and vacancies onto either PNET or Career Junction, and job seekers had any time, anywhere access via the, the internet um, onto our platforms. Using a simple search facility, job seekers were then able to you know, identify which jobs were currently available in their uh, particular location or in their sector, um, and that eventually evolved to where we are currently. In 2007, uh, a an Irish company called Seon Group um, bought Enet, and um, Seon Group is very well known for owning a number of job boards uh, across the world. And um, we yeah, ha have since been in really good company with with um, Seon Group in terms of upgrading our software, upgrading our functionality, and just becoming a lot more sophisticated um, and moving away from that kind of one dimensional job board um, process. In 2013, even more excitedly, uh, Stepstone, a German company, bought out Seon Group and then by default bought out PNET and Career Junction. Um, and all of a sudden we were part of this much bigger, broader group that is not only about job boards. Um, Stepstone is involved in the world of work and in recruitment companies across various um, areas and spheres. They own, for example, an AI company. So they own, um, they are at the cutting edge of, you know, artificial intelligence and how that can be used to make our platforms more sophisticated and, uh, you know, and really use the tech. Um, they also own a salary survey company, so um, as well as a company that helps businesses attract, you know, build employee attraction programs, so attract the right talent to their businesses. Um, and in 2015, Seon, uh, well, Stepstone um, then bought Career Junction as well. So essentially, both the PNET and the Career Junction brands are now housed by Stepstone. Um, and uh, Seon Group became a defunct company in January this year, and we now branded and operate um, as Stepstone South Africa using these two um, online local platforms. So a wealth of experience um, and uh, yeah, and technology behind the two platforms. The workshop rules for today, um, I think we've got an hour, so probably another 55 minutes. Um, they're really simple. Be present, you know, turn your phone upside down, try stick it, you know, sit on it if you have to, but try and pay um, attention for the next hour and see if you can, you know, really get um, into the information and the content that we're going to share. As Lisa said, don't be afraid to ask questions. You can put your questions into the chat and we'll visit them um, as we go through the session. Um, so you can just type them in there. The first one we're going to go back to is just to read out some of the um, some of the people who have introduced themselves and get a sense of what you're looking for out of the workshop, if you wouldn't mind, Lisa. Thank you, Michelle. Um, let us start with uh, Komotsu. Um, uh, hi, I'm Komotsu. I want to know more about how to prepare for an interview. And then Brian is asking, what are good ways to follow up on interviews? Can I contact the recruiter? Do they normally give feedback, even if not successful? And then we've got Kim Lu. I want an understanding how to calm interview nerves and how to structure answers to competency-based questions. For example, tell me a time when conveying one's weaknesses, but responding with a strong response to remedy the weakness. The Precious is wondering how do I articulate myself when answering interview questions without showing fear? Estelle is asking what do recruiters look for in an interview? And um, Tess Lynn also, <clears throat> excuse me, was um, wanting to know about how to control nerves. And then we've got um, the last one for now, or way to is expecting tips and insights on how to ace an interview, referrals to channels where I can go to learn more about interview skills. Thank you, Michelle. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for your responses. 
the good news is we cover every single one of these things that have been mentioned. Um, so, you know, how to calm your nerves, how to prepare, how to structure your answers, how to articulate, articulate yourself in a certain way. Uh, I mean, before we even jump into the content, the, the key the key thing from my side is to always be authentic, you know, and I, I can't remember who said it um, might have been precious, but it's, you know, nobody expects you to be absolutely perfect when you arrive for the interview, but you do need to be able to explain, you know, if you have a gap, how are you going to close that gap? Um, you know, how do you overcompensate in other areas if you, you don't quite meet the criteria in, in, in certain places? So, yeah, great. I'm excited because, uh, yeah, we have we have um, some, yeah, we have some guidance and some tips as we go along. So the way that I've structured, yes. Michelle, um, my apologies. I just want to read out the last two that came through now. Sure. Um, so Babalo was asking, what questions should I never ask in an interview? <laughs> And then Basil was wondering, um, can you still apply for a job when you don't meet the qualification requirements, but you have years of experience? Perfect, thanks. We Thank do talk you. a little bit about questions that you shouldn't ask. I mean, it's it's the, it's the usual suspects, politics, religion, um, that sort of thing. But I'm going to quickly answer the question about can you apply if you don't meet the criteria, because we don't cover that necessarily um, anywhere in the, in the content. The response, and this is my response from a recruiter's perspective, having been somebody who's written the job, a job spec, um, I will always write a job spec for you know, the unicorn that I'm looking for in that position. But the reality is that you know, somebody will only ever really meet 60 to 70 percent of your criteria. It's very, very seldom that the person you're going to fill the job with or the vacancy with <clears throat> is in fact, you know, has been Kind of trundling along their career path looking for this exact job spec um also because companies are different so you know if i'm looking for a particular person in for example a brand manager role at my particular company i might chuck in an extra couple of tasks because they don't really they're not really housed by any other responsibility in the business so i i would never worry about meeting a, a job spec 100 if you can meet it 60 to 70 percent and you can go in there and demonstrate, you know, the extent to which you meet the jobs, the job spec. And we do talk about this a little bit later, but more importantly, the extent to which you don't meet the job spec and how you're going to um, either upskill or, you know, how you can, as I say, overcompensate in other areas. So it's not necessarily about matching that job spec 100 percent, but it's about understanding where there are gaps. What are you talking to those gaps? So don't just ignore them in the interview and hope they don't ask about them. Actually address the fact that you don't have the skill set um, and this is how you plan to overcome that. Perfect. So as you can see there, the contents is um, the way that I've structured the, the slide deck is to just talk a little bit about um, interviews in the context of what they actually are. Um, and then what you do before an interview, during and after. And then there's time at the end, I hope, for some, some Q&A. So looking at what is a job interview, I think you'll all be very familiar and say, of course, we know what a job interview is, um, but essentially it's really where you answer questions that highlight your skills and qualifications and suitability for a job. It's usually held with one interviewer and one interviewee. Um, sometimes it can be a panel of interviewers and you might go through multiple rounds so that, you know, as you go through um, a set of questions, you're kind of jumping through these hurdles to ensure that you're actually the right candidate for the job. That can take place in person, over the phone, via more frequently via a video call or in a group setting. And you'll probably find as you go through these multiple rounds, those different channels will be used in different ways. What is important, which um, I find that, you know, that job seekers and graduates often forget about, is that the aim is not only to find out if you're a good fit for the job, but if the job is a good fit for you. So you want, you want to have a good match with the company as well, the company culture, the people you're going to work with, the people you're going to work for. Um, so it's as much about you interviewing the, the company as it is about them interviewing you and your suitability for the role. And I often find going into, into an interview that helps me personally be a little less nervous about the function or about the interview. 
So another question for you, have you had a job interview before? Um, so how many job interviews have you had roughly? How long ago was your job interview? And then if you can just type a little, you know, a couple of words in the in the Q and A as to how did it go? You know, did it go well? Did it go poorly? Um, I've really got an idea of the kind of things we're going to cover in terms of, you know, where, where you want to close some of those gaps. But yeah, just let me know how, how you, what exposure you've had to the interview process before. Then, as I mentioned, there are various interview stages. So usually the first one will start with a phone call um, or, you know, in, in more recent times, perhaps even a video call. And this is usually done with a recruiting or hiring manager. So in our business, for example, it would be the HR person or the recruiting person within the HR team. And it's really just a very top level chat um, to kind of go through the basics of your CV. You know, who are you? What is your career path and your history? What is your current situation? So are you looking to move? If you've applied for the job, why did you apply for it? Um, if you didn't apply for the job and they've found you on the platform, um, you know, are you open to moving? Uh, what are the basic skills or experiences that you have to, which would match the job spec? What are your, are your salary expectations? At which point will you be available? So is a two weeks notice immediate, one month, whatever it is? And then that HR person will kind of talk you through if you've if you're comfortable with the process, uh, it seems to be a good fit. Your experience matches what they're looking for. Then that HR person will talk you through the application process. So what are the next steps? What can you expect um, from the company? Then you'll have what we call our technical interview. And that's really with the hiring manager and and or peers. So, for example, if I'm hiring a brand manager in my team, I would conduct this technical interview because I'd be asking questions about the marketing experience that the HR or recruiting manager wouldn't necessarily know to ask or to probe. Um, and often I will call in my peers into some of those interviews, depending on the um, the sort of level of that that brand manager. Uh, I work very closely with our sales team and our product team, so often I'll include our sales manager or our product manager so that they can also get a sense of the extent to which this person is able to kind of work in the team, you know, not necessarily their marketing skills, but their culture fit, which is so important in our business. So your technical questions will give you a sense of your ability to perform the requirements of the job. You may be asked to work on a specific case or a you know a specific task, um, and then often you can do those uh, at home or you know, sometimes you're actually asked to do it in the interview. You know, given 20 minutes to prepare, um, etc. And then, as I mentioned, culture fit is a very important one. So culture fit will either be part of that technical interview. As I said, I bring in uh, my peers if I'm uh, interviewing, so that it's not a separate meeting. Um, and from your very first uh, call with the recruiter you would already, they would already be sussing you out in terms of a culture fit for the business. And a culture fit really focuses on your behavior. In other words, how did you handle past situations? You know, how do you work uh, with, with various teams? How do you manage conflict? How do you deal with change or learning new things? Um, how do you deal with feedback? And it's really to understand whether this is not to trip you up. I think a lot of people believe that, you know, there's a certain, there's a very specific response you need to give here. I mean, obviously, there's always guidelines as to how best to respond, which we'll get to. But the truth is, you want to you you want to be authentic in this process. You want to be authentic the whole way through an interview because if you have either you know doctored your interview to get your foot in the door, um, or you've you know put yourself forward in a particular way um, in your interviews, but that's not actually who you are as a person. Chances are, even if you get that role, you may not, it might not be a happy fit, you know, or a good fit between you and the company. So always be as authentic as possible when it comes to the interview process. OK, looking back at some of your responses, how many interviews have we had? How, how long ago? How did it go? Have we got any answers there, Lisa? Um, there is somebody who posted that they attended a speed dating type of interview and um, they said that they flaked. So I guess it was <laughs> quite an intimidating experience. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's um, 
yeah, for me, that's a very strange way to recruit because you just don't get enough time to understand the person. It's also a very, it's a very pressurized kind of environment. So you're definitely not, you know, putting the recruit, the, um, the interviewee at ease and getting the best out of them. So it's a very, it's a very, for me, a very strange way of recruiting. Yeah. And then there's also just somebody who mentioned that they attended an interview and according to them, it went quite well. Um, nice. But then when they were trying to get feedback about, um, you know, the appointment, um, they couldn't get a response. OK, so they're also not sure what went wrong. Yeah. And how long ago was that interview? We don't. We uh, Can somebody just put that in the chat so we know sort of the frequency of of lack of communication from the recruiter? OK. Um, we will wait for them to come back to us. Perfect. Yeah, while we do that, um, just to mention, so uh, PNEDS and Career Junction, we often get, um, job seekers often confuse us with recruitment agencies. So I just want to reiterate, so that's why I always put that slide up, you know, to say that we're the platform in the middle and we connect uh, recruiters and, um, and, and job seekers. We're the platform that enables. So, you know, we, I wish we, recruiters are notorious for not giving feedback. And I think it's just the nature of the beast. In South Africa, the, the, we get on average through our platforms, we get on average between 100 and 120 applications for every single job that is advertised. Um, if we look at our European uh, colleagues, our European uh, businesses, they get on average between 12 and 15 applications per um, per job listing, per vacancy that's advertised. So the sheer volume of um, of candidates that recruiters deal with, and this is by no means an excuse for recruiters, because you know I've been on I've been on the other side of it as well, where you're waiting for a response and it just never happens. You just assume at some point that it it hasn't worked out, even if it's been a successful what you feel is a good interview. Um, but unfortunately, we don't. We aren't able to control. Once we've made that introduction, and the technology of our platform has matched the job seeker to the job vacancy, it's unfortunately then just a relationship between the job seeker and the recruiter. We don't have any um, any say in how that recruiting process goes from there on out. We have tried to build in ways and, you know, incentivize recruiters to go and close the loop on our platform. Um, but often, as I say, it's just a volume game. There's just so many of them that they kind of just move on to the next step. OK, so looking at the before, um, and I always use this quote by Bobby Anso, who, who was a famous, I think, a famous American racing car driver. Success is where preparation and opportunity meet. We all hear about um, people that, you know, th they were just in the right place at the right time. Um, and, you know, something happened and, and uh, there was a great opportunity that came out of it. But opportunity, if, if we are prepared, you'll be surprised at how often those opportunities come up. It really is, a, you know, a, a great place where opportunity and that preparation come together to drive success. Um, and there's a lot. Uh, um, I can't remember, it was probably three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago that um, I did a, a presentation to with with the same group, with the UNISA team um, around how to maximize your online profile so that you can put your best foot forward. And preparation in building your online profile is also so, so key, not only for the interviews, but, you know, to make sure that you are putting your be best foot forward uh, wherever the opportunity um, presents itself. So the first thing that I would do if I got a job, uh, if I knew I was going to have an interview, is to go and research both the company as well as the interviewer. Um, often, you know, often people will just interview the company and and uh, and consider themselves prepared. But it's always good to go and stalk the interviewer on LinkedIn or you know the company um, the company webpage and see if there's something about that person and understand a little bit about their background if there's a write up on them or something like that. So. Go onto the website. That's always an obvious one. You know, look look at the type of work that they do. Often you can pick up something about their culture. Um, if there's company photos, you know, you look at the dress sense. That'll also tell you about the culture. It'll tell you who their target market is. So who does the company actually speak to in terms of their um, who they market to? 
look at their social media pages. You know, a, a website is often more static than social media. So social media, they'll um, generally post if they're involved in some sort of sponsorship or, you know, community projects. Or, so social media pages will also give you a lot of insights about the company. Google, uh, you know, if you Google a company name, you'll come up with articles and press releases, uh, maybe the history of the company, anything to do around their growth or projects they've been involved in, as well as red flags. Um, I, I won't tell you the name of the company, but I um, did this in preparation for an interview and I actually declined the interview after seeing all the articles that popped up um, about the, the business. And it was really about the, the leadership of that business, um, which was not uh, attractive to me at all. So. Do your homework um, before you go down that path. And if you're able to chat to current employees, you know, if you know somebody that works there, or if you know somebody that knows somebody that works there, it's always great to get an insider's story um, or perspective on the business. Generate lots of questions. Make a list of potential potential interview questions, but also make a list of the answers that you, you know, so what, what are the questions that you're going to expect to be asked and how are you going to answer them? And then practice answering those questions, not just by reading the comments or the bullet points, but literally do role play either, you know, with a friend or a family member, or you can literally just do it with yourself in the mirror. But practice answering those questions out loud, you know, so that you can remember the key points and the phrases that you want to cover, that you want to cover. Also, we sound different out loud than we do in our heads. So practicing them out loud is really, really key. And that's going to um, help you when we spoke a little bit about nerves earlier. That's practicing your answers out loud is really going to help you settle your nerves. And then write your own list of relevant questions for the interviewer. But don't ask information that can be easily found online. So don't ask questions to the interviewer for the sake of, on, of asking questions. You know, often people feel that when the when the when the question is posed to them, you know, do you have any questions? They feel like they have to ask something in order to be interesting or to be informed. Or, but if you're answering a, asking a question that's available on their website, that's not going to show you in a good light um, because it's going to almost have the opposite effect to to show that you didn't really do your research or your homework before you arrived for the interview. So here's a whole host of questions that you can ask the interviewer. I'm not going to go through all of them because this will be probably a full hour just here. But if we look at some of them, you can maybe do a screenshot if you can on your side. Um, but, you know, as I said, don't ask questions that are in the job description. So if the role's already been defined, then, you know, that that's already been dealt with. You can ask questions about the interviewer so that you could you, they can help you understand the company values or where the company is heading. You know, what did you enjoy about working here? That's absolutely acceptable. Um, in terms of the management style, you can possibly ask things like, do the, you know, how do your leaders encourage employees to ask questions? Questions that you can start to get a sense of how the leaders or the leadership of that company aligns with your expectations. Uh, company culture, always really, really good to probe on company culture. And there's a couple of questions. Um, uh, uh, possible questions there, you know, what is your work culture like? How would you describe the work environment? And those are the kind of things that you wouldn't have in your job description and you wouldn't necessarily get from the company website. So that's a great interview question for your interviewer. How would you describe the work environment or the company culture? Uh, what else can we look at? Um, yeah. If we look at f potential future co-workers, you know, is you want to figure out is, is this a group that you want to be part of? So a possible question there is, can you tell me about the team I'll be working with? You know, if I go into a business, if I go into an interview um, as as a marketer, I will always ask the interviewer about the agencies that they work with. You know, what do they have aid, uh, agencies on board? Uh, what kind of agencies are, you know, do they have a specific social media agency an advertising agency? How long have they been working with them? Because that for me explains, it tells me a lot about the, how, the importance of marketing in that business, um, you know, and it's not so that it's not seen as simply a support structure for the sales teams, for example, putting PowerPoint presentations together. It's actually a strategic part of the business that they, that they have invested in. So I'll often ask about not only the team I'll be working with, but the supporting structure around that team. Um, are they tapping into expertise from agencies? Um, and then the last column there, next steps, you know, you want to make sure that you're both on the same page before you leave the interview. So what what are the next steps of this process? When can I expect to hear back from you? That's it. it it's absolutely acceptable to ask those questions in your interview. 
this is a key one. So this this slide really talks to what I spoke about earlier. That you know is looking at the job spec and then making sure that you or indicating exactly where you match that job spec. So the job spec that I've put on the um, on the right there is actually the job spec for this position that I currently have now. Well, it's a, it's an extract of the job spec that I have in this position. And um, if I look at uh, maybe the second bullet point, ex you know, experience driving B2B, business to business demand. That was definitely a gap for me in terms of uh, my skill set and how I met the job spec, because most of my marketing experience uh, before here had been in um, B2C marketing, business to consumer. So talking to the end consumer as opposed to talking to businesses who then talk to the end consumer. So B2B marketing is very different to B2C marketing, and that was a very clear gap. They were asking for somebody that had experience in B2B, and I I didn't have enough or didn't necessarily have, you know, that is the majority of my experience. But that was something that I came prepared to discuss, to say, so that's the second bullet point there. Don't, you know, write down what to say where you don't meet the requirement. Um, and if there's a preferred skill or experience that you don't have, explain how you'll be competent without it. So it's important to match and literally go through every line of the job spec and say, you know, this write down. This is how this is the experience I've had that matches it. This is where I'm, you know, potentially falling short. This is where there's a gap, but this is how I'm going to overcome the gap. Um, and as we mentioned earlier with that, you know, the the if you don't ma match the job spec 100 percent, which I can almost guarantee you never will, nobody ever will, um, is address those gaps rather than ignore them. Practice your anecdotes, you know. So again, this is, re remember this is all before the interview. Practice, if you've got an accomplishment that you're proud of, you know, to, um, find a way to build it into the conversation. Um, it talks to, you know, talk to one that explains explains or displays the skills uh, that are required by the job and how you have those skills. Speak about the time you made a mistake. You know, mistakes are human nature. It's and this is going to help you kind of come across as authentic and, and uh, trustworthy and believable. You know, choose a mistake from the beginning of your career that led to an important lesson being learned um, and how that lesson has been useful moving forward. Uh, so rather than, you know, covering up any mistakes you've made, put it out there, but turn it on its head and talk about how that mistake has helped you be better at your job now. How did you handle a difficult situation? So again, conflict is, you know, it's part of business. We work with very, very different personalities and we work with lots of personalities. So how have you handled a difficult situation in the past? Um, and the risk, you know, when you're formulating a response here, be really careful not to blame others. Even if others were to blame, which is often the case, make sure that you're focusing on the solution that you provided rather than, you know, the fact that this other person was in the wrong. Uh, speak about a time that you went over and above the call of duty. You know, what was required of you and how did you go beyond those requirements? How did you, how did you, um, yeah, kind of, you know, exceed expectations? And then a big one, which uh, is linked to conflict management is, you know, Speak about a time when you disagreed with your boss. So again, no blaming, but focus on how you manage that situation and how you were, how you moved past the disagreement to reach an understanding. And often in, in this particular kind of anecdote, it'll talk about um, almost like your, your negotiation skills, or it'll talk about the extent to which you, you, you believe in your skills and your expertise to the extent that you're comfortable pushing back. Um, and again, in my in my particular example in marketing, you know, I often report to more commercial, um, commercially minded people. So not necessarily not necessarily creatives or people who understand branding, um, but they're more about sort of the bottom line or the revenue of the business. So for me, it's very important that I push back because if I let the leadership of the business or, or in fact, my manager drive or dictate some of the direction, it wouldn't be from a marketing a place of marketing expertise. So pushing back is again also absolutely acceptable. It's how you push back and you know make sure that you're able to talk to how you've done that. And then another quote, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So dress code is incredibly important. Plan about what you're going to, you know, what you're going to wear, dress appropriately. 
Um, there are some do's and don'ts, some very clear do's and don'ts, always err on the side of caution. So, you know, the only little caveat or disclaimer I can put here is if you're applying for a creative position, because often, you know, the, often that does come with a certain territory in terms of how you can dress, you know, uh, how you, how and whether you can expose any tattoos that you have, etc. But if you're not sure, rather err on the side of caution, dress subdued and classic. Um, and again, this will be part of your research. If you're looking online, if you don't find anything on their website or social media and you can't find any pictures, you know, of kind of people or workers, go and stop by the offices if you have to. See how people, you know, that are coming in and out of the office look and what they're dressing, um, how they're dressing. And wear clothes you feel confident in, you know. Um, I, have a, I have a power dress that I always use for my interviews. It's black. So it's classic, uh, depending on the interview or the company, I'll either wear it with sneakers or I'll wear it with, you know, classic heels, but I really feel so confident in that dress. So um, be comfortable, but dress in, in some sort of power outfit that you're always going to have for interview purposes and be comfortable. You know, it's important that you're comfortable so that you're already going to feel uncomfortable. You're already out of your comfort zone, just sort of being targeted with questions and having to think on the fly. So make sure that you're wearing something that you feel good in and that you feel comfortable in. And don't for the late, well, maybe for the guys as well, don't over accessorize. Don't wear, you know, too many accessories. Don't wear big earrings, big chunky jewelry. Just again, subdued and classic and be well groomed. Just be be presentable. So often the what not to wear is unfortunately is for the ladies. No halter tops, you know, no jumpsuits, no athletic shoes, t-shirts, just always err on the side of caution and, and look your best. First impressions, that's what it's all about. And then empower yourself, you know, practice a firm handshake, strong posture, tent of body language. And I promise you, um, now that we're post COVID, uh, practicing a firm ha handshake goes a long way because if you give somebody a firm handshake, you want them to feedback like, actually, you hurt me or that, you know, that felt a bit limp. You could definitely you could definitely be a bit more uh, kind of assertive with your handshake. Um, so go and practice these things with people uh, rather than just thinking them through. Think of a mantra that you can call upon for self-confidence, you know, no matter what, I will do my best. I deserve everything I deserve, I desire. I am confident and I value myself. Tell yourself these things, the power of positive thinking. Tell yourself these things, you know, in the days leading up to your interview. Be rested and healthy. And, I, I, you know, I've never seen uh, anybody give this as an interview tip, but for me personally, it's one of the most important things leading up to an interview and not necessarily the day before the interview, because usually you would be quite nervous and you know quite anxious. So make sure that you're banking some sleep um, and some good meals, you know, two, three, four days before the interview. Try to imagine yourself acing that interview. So visualize, visualization is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I do, I participate in, a, um, in triathlons occasionally and a triathlon is a very complicated race because there's three different disciplines. You you know, you swim, then you cycle, then you run. And in between, you've got to change kits and you've got to get your bicycle. And you've got to take your shoes off and you've got to do all sorts of things. And before I, before I go into that race, I visualize exactly how I'm going to come out of the sea, where, where my bag's going to be, what I'm going to take out of that bag, what I'm going to put into that bag, how quickly I'm going to do it, where my bike is positioned in the bike park. Visualization and visualizing yourself um, going through the whole interview process is again something that's really going to help you be at ease when you go into that situation. Eat wholesome, healthy meals leading up to the interview. You know, cut out the sugars. Sugars, you won't sleep well on sugars. They're going to make you more ratty and more anxious. If you are prone to anxiety, use breathing techniques or meditation the morning of the interview. There are some great breathing techniques online. You can follow some YouTube videos. You know, there's um, an app called Headspace around meditation. So lots and lots of online tools that can really just help you kind of collect your thoughts and gather yourself before that interview. And then plan on, you know, the final planning on the day. How are you going to get there? Make sure that you, you know, you know the taxi routes or, you know, if you um, are driving or you're taking an Uber that you know exactly which direction you need to be heading in. Um, have you got the correct address? You know, have you mapped it out in Google Maps? Um, what do you what are you going to take with you? Do you have maybe an extra copy or a printout of your resume that you can hand over uh, or portfolio, depending on what you're applying for? So think about how you're going to get there as well. and 
always leave ample, ample time. Nobody's going to penalize you for arriving early for your interview, but they are going to penalize you or create some sort of perception about you if you arrive late or you're and you're going to arrive stressed if you arrive late. OK, moving on to the jury in. So. It's important to know which stage of the interview you're at. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, there's kind of your initial uh, interaction with the HR person or the recruiter. Then you're going to go into the technical interview with probably the person that you would be reporting into. And then you've got your culture fit interview, which might be with some peers or it might be, you know, with kind of um, your your the person you're going to be reporting into's manager uh, just so that they can get a sense check of whether you're the right person. So in the technical interview, the, the interviewer is going to have a much higher expectation of um, of you, your skills, how you match the job spec than they will than the for example, the recruiter would have or the HR person would have had in the screening interview. So again, looking at, you know, from a marketing perspective, from my perspective, um, one of the questions that I would ask is how do you keep your skills current? You know, marketing moves at such a rapid pace that it would be important for me to understand um, the extent to which my the candidate that's applied for my position is upskilling and staying relevant and on trend outside of the information they're going to be exposed to in the job. Um, so yeah, think about the kind of questions that you can expect for your particular interview or your particular sector or role and make sure that you're prepared to answer those questions. And this one, I often, I, we didn't get it today, but I usually get in the um, in the intro questions, people say, I hate it when the interviewer asks me to tell me a bit about yourself. What do you do? How do you say it? You know, how long do you speak for? This is often very uh, the, the very first thing that an interview will ask you is to talk a little bit about yourself. Um, so you should know how to do that. And again, as with everything I've mentioned already, you should practice that. Um, the rules are you speak for five minutes or less and five minutes is actually again when you're speaking out loud, it's a very long time to be talking about yourself. So if you can do it in three or four minutes, even better. And you talk about your professional journey, so no personal details. Uh, you're talking about your your um, career history. If you you know if this is your first position you're applying for, you talk about your studies and what's kind of led you into this field, and you talk about your experience and skills that will add value to the position. So you might not have picked it up, but this is probably the third time I've mentioned value. That's essentially what companies are going to pay you for. That's what your salary is about. You know, your salary isn't about sitting in the position and doing the tasks. It's about the value that you can bring to the company and to the position. So always try and talk to the value that you're going to bring. If you are moving into a different industry, which is which is very common these days, and you know, if I talk about uh, from a marketing perspective again, from my personal experience, there's lots and lots of movement within marketing. You know, there's there's um, people like myself who, you know, entered marketing when when it was well before digital, well before digital, and um, and we're now trying to, you know, transfer those skills into a more digital environment. So if you are moving into a different industry or a slightly different role, highlight those transferable transferable skills that you can bring to the job and make sure that you're prepared to answer those. Um, you know, you don't want to be talking about your career history if it's actually completely irrelevant to the, the job that you're now trying to get. If you're an entry level candidate, focus on the qualifications. So again, talk about your, you know, what you're studying, what you've studied, what you've got, what interested you in uh, that field and talk about any casual work experience or volunteering you have. So I've just mentioned that you don't want to talk about your, um, you know, your career history if it's not relevant to the job you're applying for. But if you don't have any industry specific um, uh, uh, jobs before, talking about casual work or volunteering can really help the interviewer understand that, you know, you're a go getter. Um, that you're interested in the community. So that it talks more to your soft skills, the things like how do you deal with conflict? Um, how do you know? Do you have any budgeting experience? Can you project manage? Do you get on with te team diverse teams um, and that sort of thing? We had in one of the intros, somebody said, what, you know, what questions do I avoid? Don't talk about any personal information like marital status, children, any politics or religious affiliations. That may come out um, organically. And in fact, you know, we have a lot of interview um, training uh, at Stepstone and you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that's not something your interviewer should be asking you about. Um, often, 
interviewers ask about children because they believe that, you know, a, a single person might be uh, more committed to a role than somebody that has children. These are those kind of questions are actually illegal to ask. Um, so, yeah, don't offer this information. And if they do come up in the interview, you know, be quite cautious about how you how you respond. So how to build a reply to this particular question? So depending on where you are in your career, you want to start at a particular point. You know, I, I've got 24 years marketing experience. So if I started my tell me a bit about yourself right at the beginning of my career, it would literally be the kind of the full hour of the interview or the half hour of the interview. So if you're a recent graduate, start with the fact that you just graduated. Explain why you chose this career path or field of study. So talk about the passion around that particular sector. If you have a few years experience, talk about the moment you graduated and then work the, you know, walk them through your work experience since then. And as I say, if you've got, you know, loads of loads of experience or you've been around the block for a while like me, I would start kind of midpoint in my career because actually the beginning part of my career, as I say, given that marketing's moved on so so much in the last 20 years, the first 10 years of my career are, are really quite irrelevant uh, to what I to what I'm expected to do in my job now. And highlight impressive experiences and accomplishments. So again, you know, make sure that you've you've prepared, you've spoken about these, you've pulled out those key accomplishments, the work that you've done, the skills that you've learned, any key career moves that you've made. Um, but always tie this into the company that you're talking to. So an example of the key career move um, from my perspective is um, I was uh, working for a company, well, I was, I'd always worked for a corporate company. I was working for a company called RCS um, based in Cape Town that do um, store credit and insurance. And I had been what they call a very traditional marketer up until then. So lots of brand development, lots of radio ads, um, you know, some TV experience, some media, newspaper publications. But I wanted to move more into the digital space and be more relevant, especially, you know, as a, as, a, as someone getting older. Um, I it was important for me as a marketer to be relevant and to be um, to be clued up on, on digital marketing. So a key career move I made was to actually leave corporate to go and work for a digital marketing agency so that I could learn, you know, from the bottom up or learn from kind of being in those four walls every day. Um, more about uh, more around uh, digital marketing and in my interviews moving forward that is a key part of my career history that I focus on because it demonstrates that um, you know that I had the kind of ingenuity to to or the forethought to think about that um, but also that I you know have done more to upskill myself than just kind of you know move into the next role. And then conclude by explaining your current situation. So remember, this is still within your three to five minutes. Why do you want to leave your current company? Why have you applied for the job? And what are you looking for out of that job? So why you want to leave uh, is, all, is, is also often a tricky situation if it's not a great relationship or if it hasn't worked well for you. Do, you know, don't... Uh, Never blame anybody at your current company. Um, try not to get into some of the, you know, the the kind of ugly history around that. Always talk about the opportunity that that next position or that next job is going to give you, rather than looking back at, you know, why you're trying to get out of a situation. Rather talk about how you're trying to get into a new situation um, or kind of some sort of growth or development. Um, how are we doing for time? Do we have time for this blurb? Um, probably not. But yeah, this is my again. You can screenshot this and read through it. But this looks like a lot of information, but it probably takes me about three minutes to talk to. Um, and it talks about. Um, so I specifically start with uh, there's a gap in my career, in my CV of a year. So if I don't address it, that is the very first question I get is, you know, wh what happened in that year? What were you doing? Where did you go? Um, but yeah, I'm not going to talk through that. During the interview, listen carefully. So, you know, instead of trying to think about what you're going to say next, make sure that you're really listening to what the recruiter is asking you. And so that you give it a, a distinct and um, precise answer rather than kind of just waffling off, you know, your three to five minute blurb if that's not really what they asked you. Answer each question with confidence. So be friendly and courteous and be concise. You know, as I said, you don't want to waffle. Don't be thinking about what you're trying to get across. Think about what the question is. And this also, I find personally that this really helps settle my nerves because 
obviously it's, it's nerve wracking knowing not knowing what the next question is going to be, but you really it really just needs to be one or two sentences for the most part, other than this tell me bit, a bit about yourself. It doesn't need to be a whole long story. And often when you start kind of going off and waffling, it, it means that you've lost track of what the question was in the first place. So listen carefully and answer with confidence. And I think I've harped on about this throughout, but you know, be honest throughout the whole process. Ask your prepared questions to the interviewer when the opportunity arises. But you know, remember those the, the guidance that I gave earlier is don't ask questions that can be answered on the website or through the job spec. Um, and don't ask questions for the sake of asking questions. You know, if you really are genuinely interested in the culture, ask about the culture. If you're interested in future opportunities, ask about future opportunities. Um, but don't just ask for the sake of asking. And then what I, I, I keep a, well, I say an interview journal sounds very formal, but I do have um, a little notebook where I always jot down what went well in an interview and what didn't. So that the next time um, I'm faced with a similar situation, I can, you know, go and read through that and say, oh, yes, these were the parts that I really aced. So that's going to give you confidence for the, going into the next um, interview. And it reminds me where I wasn't, you know, as it didn't shine as brightly as I would have liked to. And th those will be the areas that I'll go and practice on for the next for the next interview. The awkward topic of salary. So, you know, often we're told not to talk about salary in, in, in an interview. Um, and I certainly wouldn't talk about salary during the first interview with the HR uh, or, you know, recruiting manager, because they will have been given a, either a very specific salary or a salary bracket to go and, and hire within. But when you get into the technical interview with your hiring manager, the person you're going to be reporting to, whatever that salary bracket is, is really just a guide in the business. You know, that salary bracket is open to interpretation by your hiring manager very often, if you can demonstrate the value that you can bring into that position. So by all means have the, you know, have the, the salary conversation, but have the salary conversation linked to the value that you can deliver. So first talk about the value that you can deliver, how you're going to work to the tasks that are listed in the job description. And at the end of the conversation, by all means talk about salary, but only once you've demonstrated that you are going to add value in exchange for that salary. Pick the top of the range. Um, your employer will most will almost certainly ne negotiate down, you know, so you need a little bit of wiggle room, um, but don't, you know, put yourself so far out of the running that um, you're not going to be considered. You yourself need to know the exact number. Um, so, you know, depending on how the conversation goes, you need to know the number that you want to land on. Um, and because that's what you're going to negotiate for. And once you get to that number, then you'll know that, you know, this is this is going to work. This is going to move forward. Um, often we'll take, you know, I see people taking a job that is at a salary lower than what they expected or lower than what they really believe they are worth. And I can guarantee within a year that person is going to be looking again. So um, if if that's, an, you know, if that's an issue or I can sense that that's a struggle in the um, in the interview, I don't want to be going as a recruiter. I don't want to be going through that process in a year's time again, you know, especially given how much time you, uh, one invests in onboarding a new um, a new starter. So, again, you know, be honest, be authentic, but demonstrate the value that you can bring. And then that salary negotiation or that salary conversation is a lot easier to handle. And then I mentioned right up front that the interview isn't just about the company interviewing for you. You know, you're also interviewing to understand whether the company is the right place for you to work. Um, you know, you'll get a sense through the process or through some of your additional questions that whether they are the right fit. You know, for me, for example, if you know, is the job description specific? I want to know that they know what they expect from me. Um, have they prepared? Uh, adequately for the interview to, or, or for the job itself to know, you know, what they're going to expect you to do in that particular job. Um, if you, yeah, feel free to ask questions about the leadership, you know, especially if you've come across something online that has maybe made you a bit more, you know, a bit uncomfortable. Um, does the company have a clear mission? You know, what, what are they trying to achieve? What is their goal as a business and how can your role feed into that goal? Um, yeah, are there too many hurdles or bottlenecks in the interview process? So get us, you, by all means, you know, look out for those red flags and get a sense of what this company can mean for you. 
And then the STAR technique. I think one of the questions we had earlier was, you know, how can I structure competency questions? Um, and the STAR technique is a great way to do that. Um, it, it really helps you kind of give specific real world answers, um, for example, or, or scenarios. For example, a t you know, tell me about a time you dealt with conflict in the organization. It's a great, uh, great interview question. So first you'll talk about the situation. You'll briefly kind of set the scene and give the interviewer some context. Um, but make sure that you're not being vague when you talk about the situation. They, you know, they're asking you for an actual example of a particular scenario. Um, then you're going to talk about the task. You know, what was your responsibility in that situation and what were the challenges and the constraints? And how in the action part, what did you do to overcome those challenges and constraints? You know, how how did you contribute to the task? Not what your colleague or your team did, but how did you contribute to that task? And then as a result, what were the results? Um, you know, always try to end your answers on a positive outcome. If, if the situation didn't end particularly well, for example, in this conflict um, organization, as I mentioned before, always turn that on its head, always turn a negative onto its head and explain, you know, this is how it went, but this is what I learned from it, and this is how I've carried that learning through into my um, into my career since then. And then after the interview, somebody did say in our intro, uh, yes, you know, what do we do after the interview? Is it okay to follow up? It's absolutely okay to follow up. The best way to follow up is to actually uh, do it with a with a thank you. You know, just express your interest and gratitude for the interview opportunity. Shows that you are passionate about the job. It shows that you're polite for ex for starters, but it also shows that you are interested. So. Um, a great way is just to say thank you so much, you know, for the opportunity to be interviewed. Um, I am excited by the prospects or, you know, try and refer to something that, that you found out about in the interview or, you know, that particular project sounds really exciting. I really do hope you consider me for the function or whatever it is. Do not call every day asking if you got the job. Uh, you know, as I say, this is it's such a fine line because recruiters, I find recruiters in this in this country are very, very bad at getting back um to to job to candidates and if you've gone through the process of interviewing somebody you know that short list is much much shorter than everybody that's applied for the job so i really i really think it's incredibly poor form to just not close the loop so don't ask every day you know send send that um follow up almost immediately if you know as soon as you get home if you can um uh, or before the end of the day and then if you don't hear back you know maybe follow up in four or five days in my experience, and again, having been a recruiter, there's often a lot of hurdles that, that you need to jump through, especially if it's in a corporate environment. I know with SMEs, um, it's a it's generally a lot, um, there's a lot less levels, but in some businesses, it can be, there's lots, you know, lots of people that need to weigh in and then, you know, you're actually relying on other people more than yourself. Um, so do, do follow up, you know, every couple of days, but not every single day. And if you didn't get the job, let them know that you're still interested. So if it was something that you're interested in, you know, ask them, tell tell them that you're interested and ask them what you can do to be a more attractive candidate in the future. You know, is there any are there any tips or advice you can give me that can help me, you know, you know, uh, be you know, be better at the interview process moving forward? Um, often that's a very difficult question to ask and often it's a very difficult question to answer as well. I have been asked that question in interviews. I feel very strongly that if I can provide that information to somebody I've interviewed that is going to help them, you know, kind of prepare better or or um, be more comfortable in an interview situation moving forward. It's also my personality type. I will just give them the response, even though it's awkward for me to say and awkward for them to hear. Um, so I really do hope if you ask that, you know, that people do give you that uh, that information and let them know you're still interested. Um, you know, I have, in fact, got a position before a really attractive position with a really nice brand because it was me and a runner up. They hired the, the they hired the other person um, and within a month that person's situation had changed entirely and they were moving overseas. And they contacted me and said, you know, you you were you were our second person, our second option. Are you still interested? So how you handle that response is also very key. What's done is done. Wise words from William Shakespeare. Don't obsess about the interview. You know, once it's happened, learn from it. As I say, make those notes if you can so that next time you can reference those notes and say, this is what I did well. This is where I need to improve. But 
don't obsess about it. Don't, you know, forget about saying, I should have said this, I should have said that. Oh, why didn't I answer this? Make the note so that the next time you want to visit that, you can remember that, you know, you answered that, that question um, in a very bad way or perhaps from a different angle. But take a, in that moment, take a mental break from the process. There's nothing that you can do as you're leaving that interview. Don't overanalyze it, you know, rather focus on the big picture. Um, perhaps you had a great uh, connection with the interviewer, you know, maybe you were able to demonstrate that you were enthusiastic about the role in the company. So don't obsess about that one question that you could have answered better. As I said, jot down the mistakes that you've learned um, and maybe select one or two key takeaways that you want to you know, look at later. But right now, move on to other things. And keep always keep pursuing other possibilities. You know, even if an interview went really, really well, it's not to say that uh, that you're going to be hired. So don't give up other opportunities in you know in lieu of this one great interview. Um, and take the necessary steps to move past this interview so you can be stronger for the next one. Dealing with anxiety. So again, you know, this is the theory I'm sharing, but these are these are great tips that I practice. Um, exercise is, I mean, exercise is uh, always a good idea. Um, go for a walk, go for a run, go for an aerobics workout. Literally, if it's a walk around the block, you know, just get up from your desk, take a stroll, clear your mind, see your friends. And I say they're not your family, you know, your friends, you'll offer your family, you'll probably vent and, you know, download and want to obsess about the interview, go and see your friends. They'll keep you occupied enough, but you're maybe not going to dwell on the interview too long. Um, you know, we we feel comfortable dwelling with family more than we do with friends. Focus your brain power elsewhere. So as I said, get your take a mental break from this this particular interview. Go and watch a reality TV show or, you know, some easy to read book, but take your brain elsewhere and sleep. Exercise and sleep, my two, two of my favorite things. Um, you know, everything looks better in the morning. So, you know, rather than going and having a few drinks because you you felt that it didn't go well, you know, have a good night's rest and everything looks better in the morning. And that's it. Good luck out there. It's a, yeah, it's it is tough. Um, it's a it's a hard space for you know for any job seekers, whether it's your new job, graduate, whether you're moving into a new role or whatever it is, but um, hopefully you've learned something in this process, uh, in this um, session that will help you do better and ace that interview. Do we have any questions? Michelle, we've got quite a, quite a couple. Let's see how we can maybe group them. Um, just to come back um, to the last set of questions, um, uh, the person just came back to say that the interview was last year, 2022, around oh, April. Oh, gosh. OK. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's been quite some Long time. Long time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, um, he continues to say they mentioned that they are still busy with restructuring and they will come back to me because I got the job. I've since sent through three emails to find out, but they did not say anything. They don't respond to the emails, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah, that's a long time ago. I would, and again, I've been in a business where they literally were restructuring for 18 months. So I had a similar situation where I'd interviewed somebody. We were just about to close it and they wanted a restructure. I did not want this person to go. They were great. I thought they would be great for the role. But that, as I mentioned in you know the, one of these last slides, pursue other opportunities just I would I would say mentally move away from that one if it comes back and lands on your plate again great pick it up from there but if not you know you haven't wasted any time just keep keep moving forward um then Pumzile was saying um can I just say that having more than two people on the panel is intimidating mm, it's is not it nice. possible that the other people not be there only the HR and head of department <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, you know, again, as I say, if I'm doing a technical interview, I often will bring in peers. Um, it depends on the level of the interview. So, you know, of the uh, position. Um, but, yep, it's um, whether it's one person or 10 people, it can be very intimidating. But I promise you, if you've done your preparation, you've practiced your questions, you've practiced your answers, you've done all the homework around how you meet the job description and more importantly, how you don't meet the job description, whether it's one, two or three people, it can't throw you if you've done the groundwork. Honestly, preparation is key. 
Then Tersha um, shared with us, I've recently been for an interview. It was online. I was unsuccessful due to being overqualified. The recruiter clearly made the spec so high when in reality it wasn't. Is there a way to bridge this challenge in the future? What are the key aspects of a job spec that I can look out for that will help me identify whether or not I am suitable? Um, thanks for that question, Tersha. It's a, it's a difficult question because it's a, it would be very specific to that job spec, very specific to that company. Um, I mean, overqualified, I can really just answer from my perspective. You know, I have had situations where somebody, a number of people have applied for a position and have been overqualified. And I could see that they were still really keen for the work and that they, they would have been amazing. They would have been, you know, this particular person I'm thinking of would have been incredible in that role. But I I could almost guarantee that she would get bored very, very quickly doing that function because I didn't need somebody at that level. So I don't know. I mean, the only advice that I can give you there is that, you know, to, to kind of take it on the chin. If it if you are overqualified, there's a particular reason that they are saying that. Um, and it's in your best interest as well as the company's best interest that they don't put you in a role that you are not going to be fulfilled in. Um, that's the, yeah, that's the only advice I can give you around that. Uh, not necessarily how to, if you are worried about, you know, if you are worried about facing that situation again, um, then again, I would rather err on the side of caution and raise that, uh, proactively rather than wait for, wait to be told. And then kind of in a defensive way say, no, no, but I, you know, I'm, I'm actually comfortable being at this level or so. If you do feel that you're going to be overqualified for the job spec, go in there and say, you know, I've got way more experience than you're looking for, but, you know, this is where I'm at right now. And you know, I, I'm not going to be bored in the role, you know, whatever, whatever it is that comes with being overqualified that they might be nervous about, proactively address that before, before they do, if that makes sense. Thank you, Michelle. Then somebody is asking, I will be going for an internal interview. Does it require the same preparation as for an external one? Great question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so no, in terms of obviously, you know, you'll be very familiar with the company, you'll be very familiar with the culture. Um, but what I find with internal, um, with internal interviews is that people don't prepare enough. They think they know that like, I've been here two years, three years, five years, whatever it is. Um, and so they are quite, um, uh, you know, quite sort of nonchalant or laxy daisy about the whole process. But if you're going into a different role and especially if you're going into a different department, that you'll need to do the preparation around that particular interviewer. You know, what, what is that? And again, the same preparation around the, the, the key for me is absolutely writing down the notes for every single bullet point that's in that job spec. How do you meet it? If you don't, um, how do you how are you going to answer that question? How are you going to address that? So that would be, you know, you would still do that regardless of whether it's an interview, uh, an internal interview or not. Um, so, yes, you will still need to do a lot of preparation around the role, a lot of preparation around answering those questions so that you're not nervous. You know, they might already know you, but you 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 want to have those questions and answers ready regardless. Um, it's really just the company, the company culture and the company itself that you perhaps wouldn't ne necessarily need to pay. Everything else, uh, yeah, would probably still, to maybe to a lesser degree, but you would still need to do that preparation. Then um, somebody shared with us that they interviewed for a role two weeks ago. It was for a senior role. I failed to sell my technical skills, even though I have the experience. While I was a good fit for the company and team, the feedback was that they needed a person with strong technical skills. That's so interesting. I actually have a friend, a friend and I had this discussion last week. Um, they were restructuring in her business, a very big corporate in, in South Africa. And she had been, she has been with the company for four years. And she has had a couple of um, issues with kind of her team members, you know, um, um, not necessarily conflict, but she's very strong on technical skills, but not that great on, you know, people skills. And as a manager at her level, that's a very important part. So when she went into the interview for the restructure, basically applying for the position she already has, uh, she spends so much time talking about her people skills and how she's going to address those gaps and 
um, that she actually forgot to sell the fact that she's got the technical skills, which it sounds like you might have done something similar. She assumed that the, that because she's been there, they would know that she has all of these great technical skills, but they might be worrying about her people skills. And the feedback she got, she didn't get the job. Uh, she was retrenched. And the feedback that she got was that they actually needed somebody that had a lot more kind of commercial savvy and whatnot. So always try and strike the balance. I mean, unfortunately, that interview has come and gone. Um, if you haven't followed up already, I would definitely follow up there and say, you know, you feel that you didn't kind of put your best foot forward when it comes to um, portraying your uh, the extent to which you have those technical skills and can deliver for the job. But if that's, you know, if that opportunity's come and gone, then again, I would say move forward from that. Um, but that is a really, really good point is, you know, and again, going back to this friend's example that we spoke about, don't forget to, if you're addressing the gaps, don't forget to address the basics as well. You know, I can do all of these things, but uh, these are some of the areas that I want to, that I want to focus on. Don't just move to the areas that you want to focus on. Okay, thanks, Michelle. And then Oweto was asking, as a naturally soft-spoken and reserved person, what can I do to avoid being perceived as lacking confidence during an interview? Oh, that's a great question. I actually interviewed somebody very soft-spoken a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, I said the same. I said to my manager, I'm like, I just don't feel she's got the right culture fit. You know, we're quite loud and boisterous here. Um, uh, I did hire her and she's been with us for a week or so and she's absolutely great. She's fitting in really, really well. Um, I would say, you know, for me in that situation, voice projection, just be very conscious and and aware of the fact that, you know, being soft spoken might come across as quite timid in that situation. Um, you know, once you're in that environment and, you know, you're engaging with people in there, you know, they, they get to see part of your personality and all the rest, then we can kind of, you know, move back into your, your um, not necessarily your comfort zone, but into your, your natural persona. But I think, you know, if you are aware that you're going to come across as a certain way in that interview because you're soft spoken, sit up straight, you know, make sure that handshake is a, a firm, you know, a really firm handshake without being aggressive. Um, and for just for the duration of that interview, focus on, you know, your voice projection a little bit more. Okay, um, Savannah is asking, um, she would like to know more about the confidence versus competence concept. So sometimes in an interview, we get nervous and lose confidence. However, that should not reflect on our levels of competence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's it is human nature. Interviews are horrible. <laughs> Interviews are really horrible. Um, again, I can just keep going back to preparation. You know, there's going to be you guaranteed to have something thrown at you at an interview that you're not prepared for. So make sure that you're prepared for as much as you possibly can so that it's one thing that gets thrown at you and not 10. Um, so the only advice that I have there, Savannah, is to just make sure that you're doing that preparation. Again, go back to that job description, demonstrate how you can meet all of those um, those tasks and uh, you know and uh, capabilities or whatever it is in the job in the job spec and more importantly how you can't where you can't um, <clears throat> and then practice 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 your questions practice your answers you know no often not often but you know I, I've had situations where I've gone for interviews for jobs that I don't want because I just want to practice interview processes um, especially when you're sitting comfortably you know comfortably at a job for five six seven years uh, you can forget how scary interviews are. So, yeah, practice your questions and answers um, so that you are as as confident as you can be. And as I say, any curveballs that get thrown to you, you know, it's maybe one or two things that um, that you feel a bit off, not not the entire interview process. Uh, Michelle Sydney is asking, how do you compensate if you are being asked a question in an interview? and you do not remember or you don't know the answer, do you simply say that you don't know or do you attempt to answer? <laughs> it's a great question. I've, I'm giggling because I had a terrible interview once. Um, the first interview with the CEO went incredibly well. And so I thought it was in the bag and then I actually went the opposite way. Then I went with, you know, one level down with my hiring manager after that. Um, and it was an absolute disaster. They asked me a question which I didn't actually understand. So I was completely silent while I tried to process the information. I tried to process not 
not formulate a response, but just try to process what the question was asking until eventually way too much time had passed by and I was silent for too long. It was the most awful experience. And yeah, needless to say, they were like, mm, I don't think this is going to work. Um, my advice would be, so obviously take us again, you know, you should know you should know what to expect in terms of the competency questions because you've got a job spec that you're working with, um, you know, nine and a half times out of 10. And if you've done your homework against that job spec and matched each of those bullet points to your skills, um, there's not really a curveball that you can get. If you do get a curveball and you're not, you know, and in that kind of second or two, you know you don't have the answer, by all means say that, you know, you can't say that for every single question that you get, but if you're asked 20, 30 questions in an interview and one or two of them, you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not comfortable answering that, or, you know, I can't really answer that right now, or can we come back to that question later? That's actually not a bad response, you know. Um, can we come back to that question later? And you can kind of mull it over uh, through the rest of the process. But uh, yeah, definitely don't, I would, I've, I think I've uh, hopped on a little bit about the honesty side, the authenticity side. I would definitely not make up an answer based on what you think they want to hear or based on, yeah, based on what you think they want to hear. You know, what um, what are they looking for? Rather, always kind of give the honest and authentic um, response. Michelle, and Dili and somebody else were asking questions about, um, you know, the how to answer the question of why you want to leave your current employment or your current company. So um, there was a specific comment about somebody being afraid if they tell the truth. For example, if you've been mistreated or if things didn't work out in your current position, mm -hmm. um, that the future employer might get a bad impression of you and they wouldn't hire you. So how would you address that so it won't change, uh, it won't um, ruin the chance of getting the job? Yeah, it's a, that's a great um, question. Thanks, Indile. That's it's for me. It's so important because you, I have personally had situations where I have wanted to leave a bad situation um, with a really good brand. So I knew it was always going to reflect really badly on me. Uh, so I avoided it completely. So you know, it, it's I've literally just said always be honest and authentic. But I knew that that brand was much bigger than anything that I could bring to the conversation. And also, you know, that interviewer isn't going to hear both sides of the story in that situation. So my best advice there is to is to not talk about why you're leaving. So in other words, don't talk about why you want to move forward, why you want to move on to the next position. Um, I'm trying to think of my example without uh, giving away the companies. Um, Okay, I'm making it's an amalgamation of a couple of uh, movements in my career, but I yeah was in a very um, a really awful working environment. I it was not good for my uh, mental health. Uh, it, I didn't enjoy the people I worked with. They didn't enjoy me. It was just a very very bad fit, um, and because it was a really incredible brand, you know nobody would understand that why I wanted to leave. So instead of making it about why. I was leaving, I made it about why I was moving on to the next company. So in my particular example, a big gap in my um, in my career was the fact that I didn't have enough digital marketing experience. And as, as I said, I came from a very traditional marketing background. And so instead of saying, I want to leave this job because, you know, it's just not working out, it's a bad match. I said, I really, um, I really enjoy where I'm working right now, but you know, I feel that if I don't move into a more digital role with digital focus, I'm going to become irrelevant as a marketer. So, so try and focus on why you're moving into the what you're gonna what you're gonna get out of the next job. You know, how are you looking for growth and development in the next position, as opposed to so make it about moving up into a new uh, set of challenges, as opposed to moving laterally just to get the hell out of there. If that makes sense. Uh, Michelle Pumzili linked to that is asking would it, valid, would it be appropriate to say that the reason you want to leave your current employer is because I want more money? No, uh, it's often the reason why people leave. It's, it's mostly the reason why people leave um, because they want more money, but I don't think that's appropriate as the reason to leave. So 
again, if you think about money, I've mentioned it a couple of times in this um, session, money is linked to value. If you can demonstrate your value, then you should be able to demonstrate uh, or you should be able to negotiate a salary with your, your existing employer. So if you haven't got that right, because that's your first port of call, if you haven't got that right and you're wanting to move because you actually need circumstances, well, you either believe you've, you deserve more money or circumstances dictate that you need more money, link it to back to value. So, you know, if somebody sat in front of me and said, I've left that job because I'm looking for a higher salary, I wouldn't be interested because what that means to me as a recruiter is the next time somebody offers that person more money, they'll leave. So there's no loyalty to the job itself. So I would be very cautious as a recruiter hiring somebody, even if they are you know, perfect for the role, if, they, if they're money hungry and they're just chasing the money, there's always going to be, I'm always going to have a ceiling in terms of how much I can pay them. So that's a, very, that's a red flag for me as a recruiter. What I, the way I would um, introduce that subject, because as, as I said, you can talk about money, but the way that I would introduce that topic if I was being interviewed is to say that I'm looking for more challenges. I'm looking you know, to step out of my comfort zone. So link it back to I'm too comfortable in my current role. I'm looking to grow. That growth is automatically going to, in the recruiter's mind, be linked to the fact that you're going to get paid more or expect to get paid more because you're moving into a higher level, if that makes sense. Michelle, um, somebody was also wondering, would you advise a pregnant individual to apply and attend interviews while they're pregnant? Does it not give a bad impression to the interviewers? Sure, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, obviously interviewers and recruiters can't uh, discriminate uh, because of a pregnancy, but the truth of the matter is they know that that person's going to go on maternity leave, you know, paid or unpaid very shortly afterwards. Um, I don't even know if it's possible to answer that. You know, my, again, from a personal perspective, I, it, I would definitely, even if I would like, as a recruiter, even if I think I'm not going to be swayed by, you know, seeing that that person is pregnant, um, there's definitely, it's, it's definitely going to impact my, uh, my views one way or the other. Um, if you if, if if you can't see that you're pregnant, you know that that might be a different story. But unfortunately, it is going to impact the recruiter's view of of whether you're a good candidate or not because they know just as soon as you get into the role, you know it's going to there's going to be a gap of some sort. Um, and that gap, I've got two staff on maternity leave at the moment out of my four, so that's 50% of my team on maternity leave. So those gaps are very, very difficult to um, to manage in a business. So yeah, it's not, I know it's probably not the answer that we want to hear, but that, that is unfortunately the truth of the matter. So what I hear you saying, it really does depend on, on paper and legally, you know, you can't discriminate. Absolutely. Um, but I mm. guess it would depend on the employer. Um, you know, maybe just uh, to share my experience when I, uh, I applied for a specific position, I was eight months pregnant um, <laughs> when I went for the interview and I did get the job. So oh, amazing. I love um, that. I, I wouldn't want to, um, you know, I would encourage um, those. It's the same thing. Do you meet all the requirements? No, I don't meet 100 percent of the requirements. Um, but it's also about how you talk about, you know, not meeting those requirements or um, kind of uh, allaying any kind of fears that the employer might have, um, you know, around that. So don't exclude yourself because you imagine that this will happen. That's thank you so much for sharing that. That's and I think what's really key there is to also. Um, it ties back to a couple of things I've said already, you know, is. If there's an elephant in the room, address the elephant in the room. Don't necessarily hide away from it. Rather, if you know that the that you know uh, potential employers could be uncomfortable about this, rather address it before they get the opportunity to be uncomfortable and ask you questions. Um, but I think that's yeah, and I do think that that's a very a very brave employer, Lisa. I think that's a it's a great example. I think that's a very brave employer. Um, but it also demonstrates, you know probably what you brought to the conversation. If they were prepared to, in a month, you're well, probably in a couple of weeks, you were, you know, going on, on leave. 
obviously they were prepared to wait for you. So I imagine that you were able to demonstrate value in that um, in that interview, and and that's that's key. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got a couple. Of, I'm just going to do two or three more questions. Um, so Sydney uh, was asking, how do I know if the research or if my research is on point? If the research I'm doing is really based on what they will ask. So the research that you're doing should be based on the company quite broadly. You know, the website, uh, social media is really about the company and the direction the company is going in, maybe a little bit about their strategy, who their target audience is, um, whether they're in a growth phase or they're in a maintenance phase. So it's more about the business and the culture fit. That's the research that you're going to do. When it comes to the job itself, um, you, it really is just about the job spec. You know, what is that job spec asking? And are you able to deliver against that job spec? If, you, if there's certain things you can't deliver against, how are you going to address those things? How are you going to talk around them? Um, so the research isn't about the technical components of the job. You, you know, you should have those technical components if you're applying for that position anyway, or at least as I said before, 60 to 70 percent of those technical requirements. And Michelle Tush is asking um, when talking about mistakes you've made, are there types of mistakes mm -hmm. uh, that I should avoid mentioning? Um, I don't think so. I think, um, well, I, they, they probably are tons. <laughs> so, I, I think the rule of thumb is if you can talk, talk about a mis you're not talking about a mistake just because you're answering the question, you know, and this is where having practiced your questions and answers. Um, in other words, you know, writing them down as well as practicing them out loud is really going to come into into effect because you don't want to just talk about, you know, that that day you I'm making things up now, but that day that you, you know, ditched work and and you were found at the at the mall uh you were spotted by a colleague at the mall uh you know and that's your mistake your mistake needs to be linked to what you learned from that experience and how you've taken that learning into your into your career from that point onwards so so i don't think as long as the mistake that you're talking about can be linked to a learning and how you've taken that learning forward then it doesn't really matter what that mistake is unless it's obviously something illegal or you know unethical or something like that but um mistakes are mistakes are human nature mistakes are people do them what how did you what did you do after that mistake is what's important yeah, michelle the last question that uh, we can address um there were questions about explaining gaps on your cv um, I think in your that blurb that you showed us, um, mm. you did talk about a gap that you have, um, you know, after leaving school. Um, so maybe just um, a few tips on how one could explain gaps. Yeah, so I think it depends on what your gap was for. Obviously, mine mine's quite easy to explain. I just when I first started interviewing, um, sort of early on in my career, because it wasn't my uh, work overseas in that gap year wasn't linked to, you know, uh, working in a carrot factory is not at all linked to brand marketing. So I just didn't mention it. And then people I found out very quickly in the interview process that they're like, hold on, you matriculated in this year and, and then you you started studying in this year. What happened? Um, so then I started talking about it in my interview and my CV just because I knew it was going to be the first question people asked. Um, if you have a gap, so for example, a big one which I often get asked is, you know, if you have a gap between jobs, so you actually lost your job or left the job, and then you know you've got a year or two between uh, finding your next um, your next position. How do you address that? So I think again, be honest. You know, what, how, how did you land up in that situation? So you know, either I was retrenched. If you left that job because it was a bad situation, which happens, then again, my focus would be on not what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. So, you know, so, so a, a good way to address any gaps is, you know, I took some time off to upskill, assuming you did, um, or I took some time off to, um, you know, to kind of re, yeah, just kind of figure out, you know, where I wanted my career to go. Um, I didn't feel I was challenged in this position. So, I, you know, I wanted to, think about what the next step was going to be. So what did you do in that gap that and what did you learn 
in that gap that's going to help you be better in your in this position that you're applying for either be a better person in other words you know if you took a mental health gap you know how did you what did you do in that time and how did you how's it going to prepare you for this next position um if you took a gap for studies or to you know to do some upskilling how are you going to take that into your next position so always think about yeah you know wherever there's an opportunity to talk about growth and development or learnings then try and try and guide the conversation in that direction if that's yeah uh, if that helps thank you michelle um okay so i'm going to make a few announcements um just to end off the session and then uh, my colleague um, mr mzorbe will also share with us uh there are some more questions or comments coming through um so what we'll do is just to see, um, you know, if Michelle would still be available, maybe for one or two questions after I've done the announcements, um, and then we will um, just end off the session. Okay. Um, so what I want to share with you, or just encourage you, is that the um, the virtual grad expo is coming up um, on the seventeenth of May. And this event is really to help you prepare um, for the uh, virtual uh, for, for um, speaking to employers and organizations that are recruiting graduates um, during the, the Grad Expo. So the registrations are now open. Um, so please take some time to go and register for the Virtual Grad Expo. You will be required to complete a, um, a profile on the Virtual Grad Expo online platform. And then on the 17th of May, the 27th of July, as well as the 17th of August, the live days will take place where you will be able to chat with employers online and also attend uh, presentations from different employers to learn more about the organizations as well as the opportunities that they've got available. So there will be three kind of focus areas. So it's for general, so it's for, for any student or graduate. And then there would also be specific areas for accounting and law, as well as for STEM and engineering. So please use the link that's on the screen now. I will also post it in the Q&A. Uh, to go and register and to go and check out what the Virtual Grad Expo is all about. Then in terms of our career events, we've got one more event scheduled for uh, this part of the year before the exams, and that is tomorrow you can join us for managing career change in your career development process. So the link to join us tomorrow is also available on the MyUNISA events calendar. Then again, I would just want to encourage those of you who don't know about this book already. Grad Next is a free book that you can download from the website that I've um, put there on the screen. The book contains a lot of information that could help you, for example, with personal branding, preparing for interviews, looking for jobs, starting your own business, writing CVs and cover letters and m much more information. So please go and download the book and go and see what kind of information you can find in the book that will help you prepare or to transition from student life to the working world. OK, so from my side, um, those are the announcements. Becky, um, if you could just um, end off the session for us, I'm just going to quickly look through the questions if there are any more urgent ones that we need to attend to and then we will end the session. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much, Lisa, and good day, everyone. We have now come to the end of today's session. On that note, I take this opportunity on behalf of my colleagues and the entire directorate for counseling and career development at UNISA to express word of thanks to our guest speaker, Ms. Michelle Dobson, for an excellent and engaging presentation. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your knowledge with students, especially the tips and tricks for a successful job interview. Once again, thank you so much for sharing your time and experiences with us. Thank you so much. Thank you to Lisa for facilitating this event excellently well. Thank you so much.
Finally, thank you to students for attending and making this event a success. Thank you so much. Back to you, Lisa. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, um, Michelle. There was just a last question. Um, I'm just trying to get to it. Somebody was just asking if the organization that you work for offer any services such as, for example, um, interview preparation, um, proofreading of CVs and uh, cover letters, or if they don't, if you've got any recommendations, how one could manage getting feedback on, on those skills. Sure, I actually did. I was scrolling while you were chatting there, so I did see that question. I've just put a link. Um, I put our two website addresses, uh, pnet.coza and careerjunction.coza, in the um, Q&A. We don't specifically deal with CVs. I mean, our our um, expertise is around the platforms that and the technology that connects job seekers with uh, the right, you know, the right recruits or the right job spec. But we do, um, we do have, we continue to writing blogs and putting that content up on our websites um, or our social media pages. So if you follow those blogs or kind of follow the social media pages where we link to those blogs, there's often job seeker um, and career advice in some of those blogs. Um, some of it will be about cover letters, some of it will be about CVs. We unfortunately don't, you know, kind of do one on one CV uh, reviews or, you know, uh, creating CVs, but it's kind of generic job seeker advice around, you know, do's and don'ts and things like that. Thank you very much, Michelle. I just want to um, share our contact details. So for those of you who would want to, um, just connect with us if you've got any further questions or feedbacks, uh, or feedback or suggestions. Please send an email to Mrs. Mandu Makanya. She will um, then be able to address any questions that you might have. And then if you would want to connect with a counsellor by email, our email address is counselling at unisa.ac.za. So please send any questions that you have about your career development or personal issues or academic um, skills that you need to develop to that email address. We also offer an online appointment service. So using the link on the screen, you are able to book an appointment to have an individual online counseling session with a um, student counselor on Microsoft Teams. And then we also have counselors available at the different UNISA regional offices. So please also use the link on the screen to um, get the contact details for a counsellor close to you. Our website at www.unisa.ac.za forward slash counselling contains a lot of information that you can use also to further develop your career. So in addition to the information that we shared this morning, we have a lot more resources that you can go and um, view on our website. And then I've posted a link to our YouTube channel in the chat or in the Q&A recordings of this presentation, as well as all the other previous presentations we've done is available on our YouTube channel. So please also go and check that out. So from my side again, uh, Michelle, thank you very much for sharing with us. I always also enjoy you sharing your personal experience. I think that makes a huge difference in terms of making the intimidating process of attending interviews just a little bit more human. I would yeah, say. <laughs> they, are. They, they are tough, but yeah, <laughs> preparation. That's all I can keep hammering home about. Preparation <laughs> is key. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to my colleagues. And also thank you to all of you who made time to be here this morning. Um, we will hopefully see you tomorrow. Otherwise, please go and check out the recording on our YouTube channel. Thank you and have a great day further. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.